Computer graphics sure have come a long way since the early days of computer hardware, evolving from blocky pixels to fully immersive photorealistic environments with dynamic lighting. But how did we get here, and where is the future going? To answer this, we have to first look at what drove the evolution of computer graphics. We can begin by looking at how game console graphics changed from the late 1970s up until the turn of the millennium. Game consoles provided a stable hardware platform which had to both be performant and reasonably priced for the consumer markets, so they're a good place to start. The first two decades of console graphics were entirely reliant on hardware to accelerate drawing 2D character-based graphics, but that changed in the mid-1990s with the introduction of the third dimension. Since then, the 3D graphical capabilities of hardware have drastically increased, but the fundamental principles were established early on in the 1990s. So what caused this transition? Perhaps it was the clock speed of the hardware. We can see a clear trend in the CPU speeds over time, as well as in the graphics hardware. To counter this though, once we entered the 3D era, the CPU speeds started to drastically pull ahead of the graphics processing speeds. The increasing clock speeds and transistor count did contribute to improved graphics, but if that were the only factor, then we should have expected to see better graphics on PC hardware that didn't use a 3D accelerator. We can easily dispute that possibility by considering the original Quake running on a Pentium P5 at 75 MHz. Without a 3D accelerator, most people would probably agree that the PlayStation 1 produced better graphics. Both systems are operating at roughly the same speed when you combine the CPU and GPU of the PlayStation 1. So there must have been another factor that was far more significant. It was the video memory, not just the capacity, but also the bandwidth. Transitioning from the 2D era to the 3D era saw a jump from 64 kilobytes to 1 megabyte of video memory, and a bandwidth jump from 10 megabytes per second to over 100 megabytes per second. And most significantly, it was the memory bandwidth that allowed for the graphical complexity to increase during the mid to late 1990s, which has continued to this day. Additionally, this jump in video memory capacity allowed for the transition from character tile based scanline rendering into rendering based on a full frame buffer. By moving to a frame buffer, pixels can be computed in any order, allowing for better load balancing and more visually complex scenes. Effectively, the frame buffer acts as a way to, well, buffer, the rendering, removing the need to constantly race the display beam. So that explains why capacity is important, the video memory needs to be big enough to store a frame buffer or two, but that doesn't explain why the bandwidth rose so rapidly. To stress this point further, here are the previous numbers in line chart form, which makes it much easier to see the overall trends. The CPU speed does rise quite a bit over this period, allowing for more complex game logic and environmental interactions, but the VRAM bandwidth is what makes a far more drastic increase. So what drove this trend? Sure you can say it was the need for better graphics, but that doesn't explain why higher bandwidth leads to better graphics. To understand this, let's consider an idealized graphics pipeline. This may be a little different than what you're used to seeing, but this grouping will help us think about video memory. Also, for simplicity, we will only consider the case of drawing triangles, where any arbitrary 3D object can always be decomposed into a number of triangles. The first stage is the transform stage, where we take the 3D objects to draw and project them onto the screen. This is also where vertex lighting calculations are applied, which is why both processes are typically grouped into T and L, or transform and lighting. In these examples, this stage is done on or near the CPU in a special coprocessor, so we don't really need to consider it. The relevant point is that this stage outputs a list of 2D triangles to draw. The next stage is dispatch, in which the list of triangles are collected into a Q buffer and then sent to the rasterizer when it's ready for more work. This may seem somewhat trivial, but it's necessary to keep the rest of the graphics pipeline busy doing work. Next we have the rasterize stage, which takes the mathematical form of a triangle and finds out which pixels on the screen, or more specifically, in the frame buffer, should be filled. This can be thought of as a series of hit tests, where pixels are checked to see if they are within the triangle shape. There's a lot more to this, but that's a topic for another video. The next stage is the shading stage, in which base colors can be applied to the triangle pixels, as well as texture details. In the GPUs that are being considered in this video, lighting is done by a brightness that gets interpolated across the triangle, and can be multiplied by a texture color if one is used. This interpolation base lighting is called Gouraud shading. Flat shading can also be done by keeping the triangle color constant instead of interpolating it. Fong shading is not something that these GPUs could do, since it's a per pixel exponent evaluation. Though the PlayStation 2 and Dreamcast could approximate it to some degree. Also, if bump maps are used, they also get applied at this stage. 
Then, the output will be the final color that the triangle's pixel should have when blended back into the frame buffer. And that leaves us with the final stage, blending. This is the stage where the output color gets combined back into the frame buffer using some color math. Essentially, the corresponding pixel from the frame buffer gets red, can be operated on using the shade color computed in the previous step, and placed back into the frame buffer. The diagrams here are just to show that there's more to this step than you might have previously thought, since there are many different possible ways to combine the colors. Also note that in many GPUs that support depth buffers, this is where the depth testing is resolved. So now that the pipeline stages have been explained, these are the stages that access the VRAM. The arrows denote the direction of data movement, where an arrow away from VRAM is a read, and an arrow towards is a write. The dispatch stage will often store the triangle queue in VRAM, since on-chip memory is expensive and therefore limited. The queue here is typically backed up by a smaller internal queue, so these accesses are not latency critical. As such, we can ignore the dispatch stage for now. The rasterizer stage may have to access the depth buffer from VRAM if it implements early depth testing. Technically, the Dreamcast sort of does this, but that's too complicated to explain at the moment, so we will assume that none of the GPUs do this. When the shading stage is shading a triangle with a texture, the texture data needs to be read out of the VRAM. This can be a very bandwidth-intensive task, depending on the texture mode. Bilinear interpolated textures required 4 reads, and trilinear textures require 8. So this is a major consumer of bandwidth. Luckily textures for a triangle can be backed up by a texture cache memory, since you typically want to access pixels near the ones that were previously accessed. To make this simpler, let's only consider the case of bilinear filtering, where trilinear requires two passes, just like most of the GPUs on the list anyway. And then that leaves the blend stage, which is also somewhat bandwidth intensive, requiring up to two reads and two writes per pixel in the event that depth buffering is used. This type of access is called read, modify, write. One thing that can simplify the access pattern for the blend stage is that the depth and color buffers can be interleaved, which reduces the accesses to one read modify write operation. Most GPUs didn't do this, but it helps simplify the assumptions. This doesn't look too bad until we realize that this setup requires five read ports and one write port to the VRAM. Not only would that have been incredibly expensive in the 1990s, but it's even impractical today considering that the VRAM needs to at least be on the order of megabytes. Furthermore, this is for just one pixel pipeline, where this number scales up for every additional pipeline you add. And even worse, if any one of these transactions fails to complete at a rate of one every cycle, then the entire pipeline will grind to a halt. I already mentioned the solution to this transaction problem, which is to use a cache, similar to what a CPU would use. To account for the difference in access data, two caches would be required, one for the frame buffer and one for the textures. And even better, the texture cache can be banked to allow up to four simultaneous accesses per cycle to do bilinear interpolation. Okay, problem solved, right? Well, not quite. If we use a cache, then it will really only be helpful when the memory access hits in the cache, meaning the data is present. If there's a cache miss, then the requested data, whether it be texture or frame buffer, will need to read from the VRAM. And in such a case, we still have one read and one read-write operation that may need to be simultaneously performed. So then all we have to do is try to maximize the cache hits, so that the pipeline rarely has to fall back on the VRAM. Well, that's easier said than done. There are two properties that are needed to ensure that memory requests hit in a cache, those are locality and reuse. Locality is how close accesses are in memory. If consecutive accesses are close together, then the pattern has a high degree of locality. Reuse on the other hand is how often a part of memory is accessed. If parts of memory are accessed over and over again, then the access pattern has a high degree of reuse. A high cache hit rate requires both of these properties. So, do either texture reads or frame buffer blends exhibit these behaviors? Let's address textures first, since they are simpler. It should be immediately obvious that textures will exhibit locality. Since textures are effectively images mapped onto triangles, we should expect that nearby pixels on the screen will correspond to nearby pixels in the texture or texels. This means that if you can group nearby texels together in memory, then you can ensure that cache misses can only happen when crossing those groupings. Though you may notice a caveat that's a little different from what you might expect from a CPU's cache, the fact that textures require grouping in two dimensions, not just one. This is typically done through a method called z-ordering. This basically means that the texture is broken down into a hierarchy of pixel blocks and then flattened into a 1D memory pattern. 
While this pattern looks complicated, it can easily be achieved by interleaving the bits for the pixel coordinates, making it completely free for the hardware to do. And some hardware like the 3DFX Voodoo GPUs will do this entirely transparently to the programmer and graphics driver. So if you have an access pattern like this, for example, then the Texel requests will remain relatively close together in memory, as opposed to jumping around with a wide stride. Hopefully this convinces you that texture accesses can exhibit locality. The next required property is trickier, which is reuse. This requires that the same part of the texture be used over and over again. As bigger and bigger textures are used, this becomes more difficult to ensure. Aside from drawing every model with the same small texture, there are two primary ways to maximize this, texture atlases and mip mapping. Texture atlases, if small enough, allow for large portions of a texture to be repeated by leveraging tiling. This makes a trade-off between texture bandwidth and triangle throughput, since each tile needs its own set of triangles. Here's an example of where small portions of an atlas can be used over and over again to fill large portions of a model, taking up less texture space. In this example, the highlighted regions can be used at least six times for six different triangles each. If the entire atlas fits into the texture cache, then this number would go up to 12 times for the highlighted triangles. The other approach is mip mapping, where several copies of the same texture are stored in memory at progressively smaller resolutions. In this example, maybe only the brick part of the atlas can fit in the texture cache at full resolution. But half of the texture atlas can fit at half resolution one MIP level up, and the entire atlas can fit in the texture cache at quarter resolution. If all of the models being drawn only require the third MIP level or higher due to them being very small or very far away, then you can always ensure the texture lookups hit in the cache. Then misses would only occur for higher resolution textures on objects closer to the camera. So if you weren't aware, MIP mapping is not just to help prevent aliasing of textures, but it also helps improve texture reuse, and thus increases texture cache hits. Both texture atlases and MIP mapping were heavily relied upon to achieve the graphical performance of the N64. Okay, so textures are a good candidate for caches, and it has been well studied how the cache configurations affect the hit rate. The next question is if the same is true for the frame buffer. Well, this depends on many factors, one of which being the order in which you rasterize the triangle. How is the scanning done? Do you go from left to right, top to bottom? Do you alternate directions? Split down the edge? This scanning pattern will affect how the frame buffer should be grouped. And then, let's say you group the frame buffer based on scan lines. When the rasterizer scans horizontally, then what happens when you have long skinny vertical triangles? Then you're going to get a cache miss every pixel. The common solution to this problem is to group the frame buffer into tiles. Note that this is not the same thing as character tiles for 2D graphics, nor is it necessarily the same thing as what the PowerVR GPUs did. This is just a general idea on how to arrange the frame buffer in memory to increase access locality. By doing this, you increase the number of misses you should expect for horizontal scanning, but also decrease the number of misses for vertical triangles. Since a triangle can have any arbitrary proportions or rotations, tiles provide the best middle ground. So there's a solution to extract at least some locality, but what about reuse? Well, from these two examples, you can see that we can get a bit of reuse as a result of the tiling method, which is good. But tiles aren't reused once they have been rasterized, and what's worse, is that this is just a small portion of the screen. When you look at the tiles in the context of the full frame buffer, you can see that there are far too many to fit into a frame buffer cache at once. If you did that, then you might as well not put the frame buffer in VRAM at all, which as we had previously motivated, would be very impractical. Well, if we can group smaller portions of the screen together, which all fit in the frame buffer cache, then maybe we can get some reuse. Unfortunately, there's no way to guarantee that triangles in the dispatch queue are all within the same part of the screen. So in principle, consecutive triangles can be in completely different tiles, meaning that frame buffer cache reuse can realistically only occur within a single tile. Is there a way around this? Yes, it's called binning. This is when triangles can enter the queue in any order and then get sorted into spatially local bins. Then each bin is rendered together to improve the frame buffer reuse. To my knowledge, only the PowerVR GPUs in the late 1990s did this, but it's the technique currently used by all modern GPUs. In fact, the current implementation is hierarchical in nature, which allows for different bins to be processed asynchronously and in parallel. In the context of the late 1990s GPUs though, where does this leave frame buffer access hits? Well, locality can be achieved by grouping the frame buffer into small tiles, which provides a good trade-off for arbitrarily oriented triangles.
Reuse on the other hand can only be achieved within a tile, where extending beyond a tile requires binning, which turns out to be a very involved and intensive process. This leads to the conclusion that a frame cache should be grouped by tiles, but multiple tiles in a frame cache won't really provide an improvement. You would effectively need to store the entire frame buffer in the cache, making the VRAM unnecessary. So now that we've motivated the memory requirements and access patterns, there are a few quick bits of information to help understand some architecture examples. The first extra bit of information is texture formats. One method of storing textures is to directly specify the color. This would consist of the red, green, and blue values. If the texture has transparency, that would also be included. There are several ways to pack a direct color, where the most common forms are 16 bits, 24 bits, and 32 bits. This format is advantageous because reading can be done in a single read per texel. As a result, this is how frame buffers will store their color values. Another method is to use indirect or indexed color. In this case, only an index is stored in the texture memory, which points to a color specified in a color palette table. The most common forms of this indexing use a 4-bit index for 16 colors or an 8-bit index for 256 colors. As such, this method provides a decent rate of color compression of up to 8 times with a 4-bit index. The downside is that it limits the possible colors for the texture, and every texel fetch requires two reads, one for the index and one for the corresponding color from the palette table. For a GPU to support indexed color, it must have a way to perform these two sequential reads for each texel fetch. There are also more complicated forms of texture compression like S3TC, but we will ignore those for simplicity. The last extra bit of information is a note about VRAM latency. Video memory is always composed of a form of dynamic RAM, which is the only way to economically get densities big enough to store megabytes of data. As you may know, DRAM is built using capacitors to store bits as charge. This provides much higher density storage than static RAM, which is purely made out of transistors, and is why DRAM can both be inexpensive and megabytes in size. As a consequence though, the capacitors can discharge over time, which means the stored data will disappear after a certain period if it is not rewritten or refreshed. This is handled by the memory controller on the GPU, but the DRAM cannot be written to or read from when it is doing a refresh. So this will cause periodic stalls in the graphics pipeline. These stalls do not typically last very long though, but it does impact performance. Then there's the consideration of row hits. All larger memories are laid out in a 2D grid to achieve a good packing density, which means less chip area and thus cheaper to make. This 2D grid is unrelated to pixels or 2D graphics, as it's just an interleaving of the memory address. Because of this design, accessing DRAM is a bit more complicated than simply giving it an address. First, you must activate the row which contains the data you want to access. In early DRAM, this could be done as quickly as two cycles, but modern DRAM now takes upwards of 30 cycles. Once a row is activated, the contents are copied into a row buffer, which can be thought of as a large temporary storage. For an 8-bit DRAM, this column size is 512 bytes, so a 64-bit VRAM bus would be 4 kilobytes combined. Once the data is in the row buffer, then it can be read from or written to much faster. The combined row buffer across the entire memory bus is also sometimes referred to as a page. Activating a new row is then referred to as a page break. While a row is being activated though, the DRAM cannot be written to or read from, which greatly reduces the access throughput and therefore can cause a graphics pipeline to stall. This means you want to try to keep data within a single row as much as possible to reduce the number of times you have to swap activated rows. And the last point is that there is an asymmetry when comparing read and write performance. Mid-1990s DRAM could perform a read or write in a single cycle, but it's difficult to overlap reads due to the fact that the GPU needs to send the address to the VRAM and then wait for a response. That's in contrast to just sending the data and address together. This isn't a total loss, because you can overlap reads if they are one after another in memory, which is called bursting. So the VRAM conclusions are that memory refreshes will periodically steal cycles. You want to avoid changing rows in the DRAM, because that takes extra cycles. Burst reads from the row buffer are best, compared to one-off reads, because they can maximize the read bandwidth. That works well for texture caches, since those are a form of buffer, but frame buffers should also have some sort of read buffer. And writes don't have the same problem as reads, so they can be bursted from a temporary buffer, or just written as the pixels are done. Note that the row changing and burst reads are another motivation for render tiles. In fact, the Voodoo GPUs specifically sized their render tiles so that two tiles occupy a single DRAM page. Anyway, now that all of the background is out of the way, let's take a look at some example GPU architectures.
Just a quick disclaimer, some of the following information is speculative, pieced together from what little is known about the architectures. We should start with the first 3D system mentioned in the timeline, the PlayStation 1. First, there is a new block that has not previously been mentioned, the TMU, or Texture Mapping Unit. This block is responsible for translating the texture coordinates for each pixel on the triangle into the memory addresses of the corresponding texels. In other words, it does the texture lookup for each pixel. These texel reads, or samples, are then combined based on the drawing sample method. The PS1 could only do point sampling, requiring only one texel read. This is what gave the PS1 its characteristic pixelated look. Other GPUs could also do bilinear sampling which averages the texel colors from four texels and is one of the factors that gave the N64 its characteristic blurry appearance. The PS1 only had one TMU, but it had two shading and blending pipelines, where the second pipeline was a much simpler version of the first. This did allow for the PS1 GPU to draw two pixels per cycle in some cases. The PS1 used a unified video RAM in that it contained the frame buffer, the textures, and any color palette tables needed. Because of this, all reads from the VRAM could be passed through a shared 2KB texture cache, which would be the first place to look when performing any kind of read. Any reads that missed in the texture cache would result in reading a replacement line from VRAM, which consisted of an 8-byte cache line. The PS1 is unique compared to most of the other systems, in that it did not utilize a depth buffer. Instead, triangles had to be sorted, and sent to the GPU in back-to-front order. As a consequence, the only time data had to be read from VRAM was when reading textures or drawing blended triangles. To accelerate the latter case, a small frame store was added, which held 8 bytes of frame buffer pixel data read out of the texture cache. Similarly, a dedicated color palette buffer was likely used for indexed color textures, again copied out of the texture cache. This configuration allowed for the pixel write-back path to VRAM to be prioritized, while multiple concurrent reads were supported out of the internal buffers and caches. I should note that there is a bit of uncertainty of how the color palette table was stored internally, but the GPU does have two 512 byte banks near the texture cache, which would be big enough to store two copies of an 8-bit palette table. It's unlikely that this memory was used for anything else given its size. Additionally, it seems impractical to fetch the frame store from the texture cache directly, but that may have been to unify the memory subsystem. And finally, there is a memory arbiter, which is used to arbitrate between the texture cache and the pixel writes, since both systems need to access the same memory bus. The host interface, which let the CPU upload textures to the GPU, would also go through the arbiter, but it is not shown here for simplicity. So let's look at how the PS1 utilized this memory structure. Here's a more detailed diagram of the PS1 GPU. As you can see, there are two shading and blending pipelines, which allowed for two pixels to be rendered per cycle, in some cases. Because of this, two copies of the color palette table are needed, one for each pipeline. A single TMU was shared between the two pipelines, allowing for one sample per cycle, and similarly, a single frame store was used for both blending stages. The first point to address is how the PS1 GPU could draw two pixels per cycle in the first place. Well, if both pixels are consecutive in memory, then they can be packed into a 32-bit write, which is the width of the VRAM data bus. So as long as the two pixels were aligned to 32-bit boundaries, then two could be written every cycle. This would have required a lot of extra hardware to do in general, so this was only allowed in a few special cases, mainly drawing solid colored triangles or rectangles and drawing screen-aligned sprites. The case of a solid color should be obvious as to why that would be simple to implement, you're just writing back a constant color. And sprites are a special case where the texture coordinate scaling is perfectly in sync with the pixel coordinates. This means the consecutive pixels to be drawn are also consecutive in the texture, and therefore you only need one texture read for both pixels. However, since sprites used index textures, both pipelines would need to simultaneously look up a color from the palette, and hence why two copies of the palette table are needed. Interestingly, this is the render mode that makes the most use out of the internal cache and buffers, especially when blending against the current frame buffer. This is the exact case that the Super Nintendo Entertainment System was so good at. Meanwhile, all other rendering modes had to exclusively use the first pipeline, meaning they could only draw at a rate of one pixel per cycle. This included the texture mapped Garode shaded triangles which was what made the PS1 graphics what they were. The single pipeline mode also included polygons, which were split into two triangles by the rasterizer, and included lines and points which generally couldn't take advantage of the two pixel fill rate. All of those examples assume that the needed data is already within the buffers and cache, allowing for the pixel write back to have exclusive access to the VRAM. But that wasn't always the case. Note that the cache and buffer loading was entirely automated by the hardware, and completely transparent to a programmer. 
The only control that a programmer would have is where data is placed in VRAM and the ability to manually empty all of the buffers simultaneously through a cache flush. When dealing with palette textures, it's implied that the wrong palette loaded into the palette buffers would mean loading the correct palette from the texture cache. At which point, the pipeline would be unable to draw until the loading process was complete. Given the palette port size, it was likely that this could take upwards of 256 cycles for 8-bit palettes. Luckily, this would only have to be done once per palette, making the stall less significant if many triangles or sprites using the same palette are drawn consecutively. Unlike with the palette buffer, the frame store is a different story. Because the frame store can hold 8 bytes of pixel data, this consists of 4, 16-bit pixels. So at the alignment of every 4 pixels, the frame store would need to be refilled. While doing this, the pipeline would have to stop drawing, and the refill would take 4 cycles due to the memory port width of 2 bytes. This means that drawing 2 pixel per cycle primitives would result in a 0.6 pixel per cycle drawing rate, and 1 pixel per cycle primitives would result in a half pixel per cycle drawing rate. Luckily, the frame store only needed to be loaded if the output was being blended with the existing frame buffer. If it was not, then the frame store would be completely unused. As I had previously mentioned, the frame store supposedly read out of the texture cache directly, which doesn't seem practical. There would only be a hit in the texture cache if the frame buffer data was previously read. But the only case where the frame buffer data would have previously been read was for blending against the frame buffer. Which would mean that the old frame buffer data would still be in the cache, resulting in the wrong blending. So essentially, this path would always result in further slowdown by requiring reads to fall through to VRAM and simultaneously replace parts of the texture cache that could have been used by textures. The result is that while the peak fill rates of the PS1 GPU were 2 pixels per cycle or 1 pixel per cycle, the actual fill rate would have been lower due to cache and buffer misses. However, without those caches and buffers, the actual fill rate would have been substantially lower. Another way to look at it is that the external VRAM bandwidth was 132 megabytes per second, which could do one read or write, assuming a row hit. But the internal cache and buffers could do a combined 396 megabytes per second with four independent reads, though only if those reads hit as well. This memory structure was the secret to how the PS1 was able to produce the graphics that it did. In comparison to the PS1, the N64 took a slightly different approach to its GPU. The N64 implemented a single pixel pipeline in its GPU, but in exchange, was much more capable when compared to the PS1. Some of this increased capability included bilinear and trilinear filtering, as well as more advanced transparency blending and depth buffering. Additionally, unlike with the PS1, the N64 used a dedicated per kilobyte texture memory, which was separate from the frame buffer memory. The frame buffer memory was located in the main system RAM, which was likely one of the major motivations for this approach. As such, any access to the main system memory would have taken longer than an access to the dedicated VRAM on the PS1. To combat this, a read-write frame store was added to provide a temporary buffer for staging. This frame store likely consisted of a dedicated read buffer for blending and depth testing, and a dedicated write buffer for results. These buffers could also be used to perform bit blitz style copy operations with the frame buffer. So let's look at this pipeline in more detail. Here's a more detailed diagram of the N64 GPU. Before talking about the render modes, there are a few specific features to point out. The first is the dedicated texture memory, which as previously mentioned was 4 kilobytes in size. This memory was broken down into two halves, TM0 and TM1, which each had four banks of 512 bytes, for a total of eight banks combined. The four banks were used to give the TMU the ability to perform bilinear interpolation, blending pixels together so that the textures did not appear overly pixelated, like on the PlayStation 1. To do this, the texels of each texture had to be stored across each bank instead of consecutively, hence why there are four banks per memory half. This is the same method that was used in later GPUs and is still used today. The two halves of texture memory are to implement indexed colors, where the index read from TM0 could be used to look up a color from a palette table in TM1. So when using direct color textures, you could use both halves together, for a total of 4 kilobytes of texture memory. And when using index textures, you could only use the lower half, TM0 for texels, and the upper half, TM1 for the color palette tables. This effectively reduced the available texture memory for index textures down to 2 kilobytes. So in direct color mode, the texture memory could store up to 64 by 32 pixels. And in indexed color mode, the texture memory could store up to 64 by 64 pixels. Keep in mind that if you wanted to use MIP mapping, then the extra MIP layers would need to be stored in the texture memory as well. So in the end, this is not a lot of space. 
That's likely the true reason why N64 textures look so blurry, they use bilinear interpolation to cover up the fact that most are incredibly small. Just for comparison, the fave icon used by websites in a browser is 16 by 16 pixels in size. The highest capacity texture memory configuration on the N64 could only store 16 of those in 16 color indexed mode. The one bright side is that loading the texture memory was not automated by hardware and instead control was given to the programmer. This allowed them to strategically allocate the texture memory, loading textures as needed through DMA copies. The next point to mention is that while the TMU could read in 4 texels per cycle, it did not perform 4 sample by linear interpolation. Doing so would have used too many transistors, so a 3 sample interpolation was used instead. As you might imagine, this has the potential of producing graphical artifacts, and it did when compared to true, for sample by linear interpolation. Luckily, or unluckily, the sampling artifacts disappeared when anti-aliasing further blurred the screen. To facilitate the trilinear filtering, which is when you blend two MIP map levels together, the shade unit implemented a feedback path. This allowed for the TMU to perform the bilinear interpolation for one MIP level in the first cycle, followed by the bilinear interpolation for the second MIP in the next cycle. Essentially, providing a method for doing two-pass texturing. When operating in this mode, however, the pixel fill rate drops by half, since two consecutive cycles are needed for the same pixel. The next point is the dual frame store, which had previously been mentioned. From looking at a die photo, the frame stores appear to be 9 bytes by 16 rows, which gives a total of 32 pixels in each, including both color and depth. You're probably wondering, why 9 bytes? As you may already know, the N64 used a different type of DRAM compared to the PS1. The PS1 used a type of SDRAM, while the N64 used Art DRAM. The main advantage being pin count. Adding pins to the chip cost money, and Nintendo couldn't afford a lot of them, especially considering all that the chip containing the GPU in the N64 had to do. A 32-bit SDRAM would require a minimum of 41 pins, while our DRAM could get away with just 9. Furthermore, the RD RAM was significantly faster, capable of operating at 250 MHz in dual data rate, meaning 2 bits per clock cycle. The resultant bandwidth difference, even though the data bus was much narrower, ended up being 562 MB per second compared to 248 MB per second. Obviously something had to be given up, and that was latency. RD RAM takes much longer to start a transaction. Although, funny enough, the N64's GPU ran at 62 MHz, which is four times slower than the Art DRAM. This means that the four-cycle read latency becomes a one-cycle latency for the N64, which would be the same as for the SDRAM. Additionally, one N64 cycle would be eight DDR cycles for the Art DRAM, which is 72 bits or nine bytes. And that's where the nine-byte buffer comes from, the size of a one-cycle read from the Art DRAM. And yes, this does mean that the RCP chip on the N64 wasn't actually 64 bits internally, but was in fact 72 bits, we had previously established that a frame buffer can be 16 bits, but how would that fit into 9 bytes? Well, the N64 extended the 15-bit color into an 18-bit color value by including a 3-bit coverage. The depth was similarly extended from 16 bits to 18 bits. The coverage value was used for the anti-aliasing feature, which specified how much of the last drawn pixel was actually covered. A similar yet completely different method is used for multi-sample anti-aliasing, or MSAA. Anyway, the 18-bit values divide up the frame store rows into four values, either two color and two depth, or four color, or four depth. Note that these buffers are automatically fetched and stored by the hardware, and are transparent to the programmer. And this leads into the last point, which is that the blending stage could be used to perform fast filling and block transfers, at a rate of up to four pixels per cycle. This is done by either copying a constant value into the frame store row, copying the row from the other frame store, or by copying a chunk out of the texture memory through a bypass. So to tie it all together, a normal rendering mode looks like this, which would be the case for direct color texturing of triangles and rectangles. When drawing with index textures, the path would look like this. Here the first half of texture memory is used to look up colors in the palette stored in the second half of texture memory. And then two-pass texturing with indexed color would look like this, where the shade color is fed back into the shade stage for a second cycle. So to summarize, the normal fill rate was 1 pixel per cycle, 2-pass texturing brought that down to half a pixel per cycle, and rectangular copy or fast fill could do 4 pixels per cycle. Since the texture memory was manually loaded, this was unaffected by texture cache hits, but was affected by whether or not the read frame store contained the necessary pixels, and whether or not the output frame store was full. In other words, the primary cause of slowdown would be contention with the internal memory bus, which had to be shared with the signal processor and CPU.
This means that row misses would be far more likely to occur unless the programmer partitioned memory across our DRAM chips. This also means that the N64 expansion RAM could result in a performance improvement entirely from avoiding row thrashing in the ARD DRAM. Some of that could be mitigated by the GPU performing prefetching of the frame store, but it's unclear as to whether or not that was actually done. And like with the PS1, we can compare the bandwidth and ports of the external memory bus and internal GPU memories. The ARD DRAM could do up to 562 megabytes per second with one read or write port. In comparison, the internal memories could do 2.1 gigabytes per second across nine read ports and one write port. This means that the internal GPU memory had almost a four times higher bandwidth across nine additional ports. Hopefully this is starting to convince you that bandwidth and memory throughput is primarily what drove graphical improvement rather than clock speeds or transistor counts. Unfortunately, this video is already getting quite long, so more architectures will have to be saved for a part two. I still have the Dreamcast and PlayStation 2 to cover from the original list. And it would be unjust to ignore the memory architecture of the 3DFX Voodoo GPUs, so those will be covered as well. Anyway, hopefully you found this interesting. Until next time, thanks for watching.